My name is Dr. Flanagan. I'm a urologist at the Vancouver General Hospital and associated with the University of British Columbia. I'm also the clinical lead for the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program Sexual Rehabilitation Clinic. This video is going to introduce penile implant surgery for erectile dysfunction. So penile implants are devices placed inside the penis to facilitate an erection. Some of the indications or scenarios that they may be helpful are for men with severe erectile dysfunction, men with severe Peyronie's disease or curvature deformity of the penis, or men with Peyronie's disease and concomitant erectile dysfunction. There's multiple different types of penile implants. There are inflatable implants and malleable implants. The inflatable implants uh, essentially involve the transfer of fluid from one location into the cylinders that go within the shaft of the penis to induce a change in size both in length and width for most devices as well as increased rigidity. This is typically performed by squeezing a pump and this may be a three-piece uh, device which is the most common or it might be a two-piece implant that lacks the fluid reservoir. The malleable implants just have the cylinders that are placed within the penis. These are typically quite rigid already and can be bent down when not in use or bent up when desired use. Now if we look specifically at the three-piece penile implant, essentially it involves two cylinders that are placed within the shaft of the penis. There's a pump that's placed in the scrotum and then there's a fluid reservoir that's typically placed either adjacent to the bladder or under some of the abdominal muscles. Now essentially to use this, the user will squeeze the pump that's in the scrotum and this will transfer fluid from the reservoir tucked inside the abdomen through the pump and into the cylinders within the penis. The device will typically expand in both length and width and become much more rigid and facilitate sexual activity. Now some of the pros to using a three-piece three penile implant, which is by far the most popular type of device, is that everything is concealed on the inside. There's no external components. It's the most natural feeling uh, device because you have expansion both in length and girth and rigidity. So there's a, a lot of change in dynamics uh, associated with it. The satisfaction rate is excellent and is typically over 90% in most of the series published in the medical literature. Some of the downsides are it has the fluid reservoir, which is one more component than the two-piece inflatable, um, and two more components than the malleable. So placement of the reservoir uh, involves a, an additional step in the procedure and certainly has some associations to risks and complications during this step. If we look at the two-piece implant, so this is similar to the three-piece inflatable implant that we just discussed, however it does not have a fluid reservoir. It still has a pump that's placed in the scrotum and it still has the cylinders that's placed within the penile shaft. But here, the pump is able to move the fluid from the rear of the cylinders to the front of the cylinders. So the user is still going to squeeze the pump when they want the erection to be achieved and when they want the erection to go down there is a button that will be placed similar to the three-piece and the fluid will uh, retract back into its resting spot. Some of the benefits of this is that again it's concealed, it's all on the inside of the body, it's inflatable so there is some dyna dynamic component to it and that there's no placement of a reservoir so you don't have to have the risks associated with reservoir placement that you do with a three-piece device. This is typically indicated in situations where individuals may have had previous surgery or other conditions that would make it very challenging and perhaps risky in placing a reservoir within the abdomen. The overall patient satisfaction is typically well over 85% in most of the reported literature. The downside to the two-piece implant, at least compared to the three-piece, is that it's not quite as dynamic. There's not as much movement uh, and change in length and girth, and the feel of the device is a little bit stiffer as a baseline. A malleable penile implant involves a cylinder on each side of the penis, 
and there is no pump and there is no fluid reservoir. The cylinders themselves are quite firm and rigid. When the individual does not want to use it, the implant is bent down, and when the individual does want to be sexually active, the implant is bent up. Some of the benefits is that, again, this is concealed on the inside of the penis within the body, and it can be very effective for individuals that have limitations with their dexterity. So if isolating the pump and squeezing the pump within the scrotum is going to be technically challenging for an individual, the malleable implant is an excellent option for those individuals. Some of the downsides are that it's less natural feeling compared to the inflatable implants, and it's less concealable compared to the inflatable. And that's because the penis is already at its maximum length and girth at all times. It's just pointing down rather than pointing up, where the inflatable devices are slightly smaller. There's less fluid within the shaft of the penis when uh, the penis is flaccid and erection is not desired. Due to the uh, continuous pressure, there is some risk of erosion. And finally, um, because there's no pump and expansion, uh, as I've mentioned, there's no dynamic component to this aside from flexing it down and flexing it up. So how do we place a uh, penile implant? Well, uh, there's a few different surgical techniques. Uh, they typically take approximately one hour to place this. Depending on your surgical site, uh, we often keep the patient for a one night hospital stay, although uh, sometimes we may be able to allow the patient to go home on the same day. The three different approaches involve either an incision at the base of the penis entering the scrotum, called the penoscrotal approach. The incision can be above the penis in the pubic region, called an infrapubic, or it can be at the end of the penis, like a circumcision type of incision, called a subcoronal. Some really important considerations that any individual considering a penile implant should take note of is that it's an irreversible procedure. What this means is once we place the penile implant, we can't go backwards and achieve any form of meaningful erectile act, uh, activity uh, and effectiveness. So part of the process in placing the device is that we have to destroy the natural erectile tissue to make room for the cylinders. So this is really important. Once we make this step, uh, this is the direction that we're moving in the future. The penile implant won't add any length, uh, so that's important to have a realistic expectation of what this will do. Typically we say that if you pull the penis away from your body, that's typically the length that you're going to have after the implant is done. Now, with the pump for the inflatable penile implants, the shaft will become rigid, it will expand in both length and girth, but the head of the penis doesn't change uh, as it might have when you had a good, strong, natural erection. That's because the, the head of the penis and the shaft are two anatomically distinct regions and the cylinders only go within the shaft of the penis. Satisfaction rates for penile implant surgery are quite excellent. The key here is finding the correct procedure for the correct patient. So individuals that can really benefit from a penile implant are those that will hopefully have the highest satisfaction rates and those are the individuals that the implants will go into. If we look at the medical literature, uh, they report that satisfaction rates are between 92 to 97% for patients receiving a three-piece penile implant and between 91 to 96 percent of the patient's partner with respect to their satisfaction. If we look at some of the long-term study follow-ups, how do these devices behave over time? Well, within the first five years, it's excellent. 95 percent of devices are functional and people are using them. As we go out to 10 years, it drops down to about 90 percent, which is still excellent. 15 years, 75% of individuals are still using their device and they're functional. And once we get out to about 20 years, it drops down to approximately 63%. Now, if we look over the same time period, why are some of these devices becoming non-functional? Well, 49% of individuals in this one series experienced some form of a complication that led to some of the 
functional uh, decrease. Amongst those that had a complication, the vast majority, 79%, were due to a mechanical failure. This may be um, one of the cylinders stopped functioning, a problem with the pump, a problem with the tubing, leakage of fluid from the reservoir, and these can typically be repaired or replaced uh, surgically. The old device will come out and typically a new device will be placed in and hopefully last for several more years again. 12% of patients experience pain in this series, 4.5% experience orgasmic dysfunction, and 4.5% experience an infection. Now we'll speak a little bit more to infection when we talk about the potential risks and complications. So here we have a fairly inclusive list of the potential risks and complications associated with penile implant surgery. Now the one that all of the surgeons placing these uh, implants think about is infections. The risk is quite low. Uh, the literature series typically report between one and four percent chance of getting an infection. Now there are certainly some scenarios that increase the chances of infection. This includes if we're performing a revision surgery, so we're taking an old implant out and placing a new implant, or if you have poorly controlled diabetes. As your blood sugar levels increase, the risk of infection uh, dramatically increases. Now, the importance of what happens with an infection of the device is that we have to take the device out in order to clear the infection. Now, in doing that, Sometimes we can salvage the procedure and place a device immediately in if uh, there are no significant risk factors for severe uh, toxicity. But sometimes we'll have to leave the device out and come back in three to six months to replace a new device. When we do that, it can be quite challenging and there's a lot of scarring and fibrosis and sometimes it may result in a device that isn't as large as the initial device that went in. So that's something that we take a lot of thought about in optimizing things before surgery, at the time of surgery, and following surgery. Urethral injury is another potential complication. It doesn't happen very often, somewhere between 0.1% and 4%. Perforation of the erectile chambers. So when we're doing the dilation to place the cylinders, there's a chance that we can uh, dilate too far, either towards the front of the penis or back into the pelvis. An erosion where the device over time, months to years, slowly erodes into the urethra or the P channel is something that can happen and has been quoted between 1 and 6% uh, over the device lifetime. We can make a hole in the bladder, bowel, or vessels when we're placing the fluid reservoir. Um, this certainly is not common, but potentially uh, may occur. Scrotal hematoma or swelling, collection of blood can happen somewhere between 0.2% and just under 4%. Floppy glands are uh, when the head of the penis uh, is quite mobile on the rigid shaft. Uh, this can occur up to 5%, um, <clears throat> but certainly there are some surgical maneuvers that can be performed to help stabilize this and make uh, the erect penis more functional. Some individuals may also experience pain or discomfort along with any surgical procedure. Some rarely uh, may experience loss of blood supply to the end of the penis or necrosis, but typically that's associated with individuals with uh, either quite significant diabetes, smoking status, vascular disease, uh, oversizing of the device, um, or more complicated reconstructions associated with placement of a penile implant and certainly uh, a small risk of bleeding that may require blood transfusion at the time. So in summary, penile implants are another option with high patient satisfaction amongst those with severe erectile dysfunction or individuals with Pyronis disease um, or Pyronis disease with erectile dysfunction. It requires surgery, that's typically one hour and either one night hospital stay or same day discharge. And there are certainly risks associated with any procedure and penile implants has risks associated with it as well. 
it is important to ensure that you and your treating surgeon's expectations are in alignment and you've had a good opportunity to ask the questions and make sure that you're fully informed of your procedure uh, prior to going to the operating room. Just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our supporters for the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. The Specialist Services Committee provided funding to help us initiate this program in January of 2013. And more recently, the Ministry of Health has provided funding in 2017 that allowed for the provincial expansion of our program uh, to reach more British Columbians uh, with sexual dysfunction and survivorship issues following prostate cancer. I would also like to acknowledge all of the other agencies that have supported our program throughout the years, as well as the individuals and families that have provided generous philanthropic support. If you'd like to look more into our program or connect with us, here are our contact details, uh, including our uh, email, website, Twitter, and Facebook programs. Thank you.